Well, welcome to the Transform My Dance Studio podcast, the only podcast for dance studio owners, where each week we bring you business growth strategies to help you increase your profits, impact the lives of more students, while ensuring you get back some time to have a little life outside of the studio. It's time for you to become the go-to studio in your area. Now, here's your host, founder of the Dance Studio Owners Association, Clint Salter. Hey there, Dance Studio Owners. Welcome to the Transform My Dance Studio podcast. It's Clint here, and I'm super excited that you're joining us for today's episode. Now, I've got a great guest for you today. And the reason I know that she's great is because she actually joined us as one of our speakers at our Inner Circle Retreat in Las Vegas. And our members were completely blown away. Our guest today is Sue Samson Delena, and she's the owner and artistic director of the Dance Studio of Fresno in California. And Sue has really created one of the most successful dance studios in Western United States. Now, a little bit about the studio. It's attracted thousands of dancers all throughout the state of California and especially in the Central Valley area, offers 175 dance classes every week. And she has a team, don't go crazy guys, of 35 employees. Sue, I'm so excited for this conversation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So tell us a little bit, how did it start for you? How did you get into this crazy world of studio dance studio ownership? Oh, that's so interesting. I, you know, I started teaching when I was uh, 16 years old for mm-hmm. my mentor, a gentleman named Jimmy Powell. And, um, you know, my, one of my girlfriends actually started teaching before um, myself. And I, I was like, well, wait a minute, how come she got to do it? And I don't. So I went to actually to J- Mr. Powell and said, Hey, I've got a group of my friends that wants to take jazz dance class from me on Saturday afternoons in that back room at you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, which of course nobody wants to come to dance on Saturdays at three o'clock. But my girlfriends, I talked them into doing it. And sure enough, he said, well, of course you can have that room. And so I sort of, um, you know, snuck my way actually into teaching and I, and I actually really liked it. I, I right away loved um, working with my friends mm-hmm. and um, and teaching them things that, you know, I knew from my training that they didn't know yet. Yeah, uh, uh, I love it. And so then what happened next? So you get, you get the three o'clock, you get the prime, the prime spot on three o'clock on a Saturday and you start teaching and you enjoy it. I mean, how does it, how did it evolve from there? Well, you know, I think my, my teacher and the studio owner, um, Mr. Powell, I think he saw my enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, he was my mentor in terms of, I, I was a, a, I'm a big tap dancer and he was, he's been my, he was my tap teacher from the time I was six until, um, he retired from teaching. And I, I began working with him privately at the age of 12. And so I think he just saw my enthusiasm and the fact that I went after, you know, I brought him students rather rather than me waiting around for him to offer me classes. And so, you know, I just sort of segued from there because he owned branch studios at that time up and down the Central Valley. So then I became, uh, slowly but surely, I became one of his teachers in the branch schools, um, Madeira, Kingsburg, Selma, until, you know, I actually kept um, after him to give me more classes in the Fresno branch, which he eventually did, and in the Clovis branch. And so it just sort of, you know, at the age of 16, by the time I was 18, I was teaching in um, a lot of branch studios and making really good money, actually, for a, a young person that age. So it really kind of started there um, with him just taking a risk on me. I love it. You know, one thing that you talk about is like your enthusiasm and and your eagerness. And I can imagine our studio owners like like ears pricking up when you said, you know, I was bringing you know him him students. I mean, we all want teachers that can do that for us, right? We want those teachers that are that are passionate, that are invested in the business, that they they kind of see it as as their own to a certain extent. I mean. When it comes to your teachers at the moment, because I know you got a lot of teachers, what are the things that you're looking for when employing a teacher? 
Well, first and foremost, they absolutely positively have to love children. I mean, I just don't see how you could be in our line of work and not love to work with children. Um, you know, th- th- what's really interesting, my staff at my place, I'm so blessed because, you know, the, the majority of them were are homegrown. And so what I mean by that is that they were my students mm. uh, years ago. 20 something years ago or 30 something years ago now, and they've become my teachers. And so I'm so lucky because we have the same philosophy when it comes to, you know, how to approach students, how to approach parents, what my expectations are, you know, at the beginning of the year for these children and what it is by the time we get to recital. And then, you know, in addition to, you know, this fabulous core group of teachers that I've had with me for forever, um, then the people that I've supplemented my faculty with, um, for whatever reason, they have gravitated to me and they are like-minded. So we agree philosophically, which is crucial when you are building a, a team of, of uh dance educators, uh, philosophically, you all have to be somewhat on the same page or it's just not going to, it's just not going to be end up being your vision at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. When it comes to your team at the moment, what are the things that, that you do to, you know, really step into that mental role and, and support them and, and have them stay, you know, keep, keep a clear path, you know, keep them on track with, you know, we're all moving in the same direction because I know with a lot of our studio owners, they often say, sometimes it feels like everyone's doing their own thing and I'm not sure how to kind of bring everyone back. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a huge deal because, you know, I think it's so important and I don't think it's just for dance studios, businesses. I think it's just about every business that, you know, you have to make your people feel appreciated. Um, even if they're only teaching one or two classes a week for you, you really need to go out of your way as a studio owner, I believe, and and go and watch them occasionally if you can teach or even just text them. I will text my teachers and ask them, you know, how'd your classes go today? I think they need to feel that you are invested um, in what they're doing with their classes and you're, I'm not saying checking up on them, but you are uh, dialing yourself in with them to make sure that they feel like they're part of a, a bigger a group. It's not just them all alone with that one group of eight students. So I think that's so important to, first of all, make them feel appreciated and then make them feel like you really do care by checking in often with what they're doing. And then, you know, we have meetings on occasion now, you know, because I have such a large faculty, it's really hard for me. I know some studios call weekly meetings or monthly meetings. And I just, because so many of my teachers are um, school teachers, they're, you know, they go to work during the day teaching at uh, primary or high schools. And then they come to me in the evenings. It's really difficult for us to all get together on a, on a, um, frequent basis. So, you know, I make it count <laughs> when, when we do get together. Um, I pay them, of course. And then, mm. you know, we really listen and we hammer out issues that really pertain to what they need in order to make their classes more successful. Yeah. Yeah. So, so important. Um, I, I just, cause you touched on teachers. I kind of wanted to go there quite quickly, but I want to kind of rewind so that, that we can close the loop on how you actually started running your own studio. So you were teaching at a whole bunch of branches. You were 18, you, you know, you, like you said, you were making good money. Uh, yeah. how did you end up starting your studio? Well, interesting, interestingly enough, you know, my, my, um, uh, my mentor retired and the the gal that um, ended up buying him out, it just, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. She and I just, she was a beautiful woman and, and uh, you know, I've always wished her very, very well, but it just didn't work out for the two of us. And so at 20, I found myself out of a job. Wow. Um and it was, you know, it was really shocking at the time, but it just was one of those things. And so, you know, um, I went to my parents, God bless them. And I just told them that, um, you know, I had had a couple of other offers to work for a couple of other people in, in the Fresno area. And, you know, something told me in my gut that I was meant to maybe 
do my own thing. So I did. I went to my parents. I asked them for their support. I, don't, I mean, I don't know what they were thinking. I was only 20, but <laughs> they said, okay, <laughs> and um, co-signed a loan for me. And, you know, this is back in 1982, Clint. Um, and so I started uh, a month or two later. And in mid-season, that is, March of 1982, wow. in my school in a very... Um, it was a progressive area of a town, you know, on the map. It looked like from five to 10 years later on down the road, it was going to get really big, that area of town. But at that time, there was nobody out there. But, you know, my dad had the foresight to go, Sue, you need to go north, north Fresno, north Fresno. That's where all the growth is going to be. And gosh, he was so right. Um, so I started off in this kind of remote location to start off with. And it, it took me probably seven or eight years out there before I really started to uh, honestly make a little bit of money. But, you know, anything that's, um, anything that's of value, in my opinion, is, you know, you got to put a lot of time and effort and work into. And that's exactly what I did. I knew I needed to um, get my name out more in the community. So I began teaching at the local performing arts high school, the uh, local performing arts grade school. Uh, it was called Bullard Project Talent. I did numerous plays for different high schools. I, I taught at City College at the, at the JC here. I began working with like the 49er cheerleaders. So I got my name out into that, you know, um, arena. So slowly but surely, I just made sure you know, that people knew who I was by just going to work for a lot of different people while trying to run my school. So I think that that was um, one of the, probably one of the best things I ever did. You know, it, it began to wear on me a little bit about the seventh year in on all I'm that. Sure. It took a while, seven years. Yeah. Yes, it did. But, you know, I realized then that I could cut back on some of that, mm. those extra things I was doing and focus and dial in more on my own studio because by then now I started to have a pretty solid client base. So, you know, for young studio owners, that's definitely, they have to make sure that they are, you know, creating um, excitement about them and make sure people know who they are, because why would somebody want to come and take from them if they don't know anything about them? Exactly. And at the end of the day, people by people, you know, pe you know, people are seeing that face. They're seeing you at the school. They're seeing you at that, the local mall that, you know, the, yeah. the community event, you know, and it's seeing your face over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Yeah. There, wow. there was no such thing as social media <laughs> in the eighties, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it was all uh, word of mouth and yeah. um, you know, back then you do an occasional, I don't know, uh, newspaper ad Mm -hmm. um, or some flyers on people's cars, but uh, there was <laughs> yeah. none of what we have now. And so that was my way of, of getting out into the community, just simply by exposing myself to as many different students in different arenas as possible. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that because why there is social media there, you know, and it's something that we teach, uh, you know, inside of our programs, it's still really important that you're getting out in real life to meet people and for people to experience you. I think we call it networking now. Right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Ne networking, get out of your pajamas, get off Facebook and go and actually meet some people, you know, and, and form yeah. relationships with local business owners and schools. Yep. Uh, you know, and, and really get out there in the local community. Cause the great thing about a dance studio, it's still a local business. Yes. And you know what? Um, people, if you, if you just spend a little bit of time, um, you know, asking them about their children when you're in those kind of environments where, mm -hmm. you know, I will do it at the PetSmart today. I saw somebody bringing their, their little girl in with their dog. And I was like, oh gosh, I, she's adorable. I, I hope you have her in dance lessons. You know, I mean, that's just, <laughs> and she was adorable. And I thought, gosh, what a cute little thing she should be. I hope she signed her up for dance lessons. And it wasn't like I was promoting my school. I was just saying dance lessons. And of course it led to a conversation. So just things yeah. like that, um, noticing, 
of people is so important in our industry, I think. C- completely. So you get to that kind of seven, you know, seven, eight year mark, you, you kind of pulling back on all the teaching kind of outside and, and because, you know, you've started to build a brand, you've started to, uh, to be discovered really like people in the local area know about you, know about the dance studio. What did you then do inside of the business to take it to like the next level? Well, if you're talking, if you're talking about artistically, um, and those are, I have very clear uh, moments in my my history here because I'm. This is year thirty five, Clint. Um, there's clear moments of um, direction change. I want to say artistically mm-hmm. that I think helped me um, bring in business. Now, in the moment, it didn't, and I'll give you a great example. Um, but it paid off in the long run. So, you know, years ago, um, I was lucky enough to meet a a brilliant uh, woman that is a friend of yours as well, Clint, named Mia Michaels. Yeah. And I knew, and I met her at a convention because I had, uh, I was always a big fan of uh, education. And so I began taking my students to dance conventions where they could um, take classes during the day and then, you know, perhaps compete or whatnot. It wasn't that big of competition, wasn't that big back then. But anyway, to make a long story short, I had met Mia in a class and and I absolutely positively just fell in love with her message. I fell in love with um, her work. I fell in love with just about everything there was to do about her. And I approached her about (laughs) coming to Fresno and, and working with my students. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, one thing led to another and, um, and she did, but, you know, when she came in, she recognized, um, or she pointed out to me that Sue, you know, you need to, your, your girl's are fearless and they will do whatever you tell them. She says, but you know, you need to increase their classical foundation more and you need to, to introduce them to a little bit more artistry because back in those days, you know, I, we had a really nice ballet department, but it wasn't mandatory that my dancers take as much as ballet classes as they do now. Um, and then, you know, we were doing more of the, um, what, what do I want to call it? The, it's not trickster choreography, but just more athletic. Mm-hmm. Um, like choreography. acrobatic based? Well, or? yes and no. It's just more athletic, but not with a lot of um, mm, deep meaning behind it. Let's put it that way. More probably oh. more entertaining type pieces, mm-hmm. you know, traditionally are... Uh, entertaining, but not real thought provoking. Let's put it that way. So um, she, after pointing this out to me and seeing what she was able to create on that group of kids who, you know, it was such a risk for us um, to do this. It, it really opened my eyes to just a whole nother Mm, uh, path that I could take with my school artistically. And boy, I never looked back. And, you know, and it created issues because there were people that simply didn't want, there were families that simply didn't want to commit to that many ballet classes a week, or it wasn't their preferred style. But I just knew in my heart, I needed to go down this road um, in order for my school to improve, you know? So that's a that's that's a that's a crucial thing that I think studio owners need to, you know, take a long hard look at themselves periodically and and maybe ask outside um, people that they respect. You know, what do you think my school needs to work on? I mm. I do that all the time. Honestly, I ask Ray Leeper every time I see him. I always ask people, where do you think? What's a good? What do you think we need to work on here at the yeah. dance? Fresno and they will always share with me you know um what they think and I love that so uh, I don't know if that answered your question uh, business wise you know um probably with the introductions of teams more teams maybe because back again when I first opened there wasn't a lot of um there weren't a lot of dance competitions or conventions when I initially opened mm-hmm. but as my school Uh, matured. Yes, there were. And so I saw the need to create a division where we could take students who were, you know, really serious and wanted to do all this training. I could take them places where they could, you know, either uh, perform more or, or compete. So I think that that was a, a decision that has helped me. 
Yeah. Although, you know, relying on dance teams to make you a lot of money is, is, uh, is a really difficult choice to make, I think, as a studio owner. I think that, um, people don't realize maybe that, um, you know, you prorate those lessons so much for dance team members that mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you're not really making the uh, uh, the profit that you need to make in order to cover your expenses, you know, with just dance team, competitive dance teams. Completely. Uh, and that's a, you know, and that's a topic that, that we went into detail with um, when you joined us at our Inner Circle Retreat in, in Las Vegas, because it is, a, it is a challenge for studio owners. You know, how do we run a, a competitive team, uh, competition teams, as well as have a thriving, you know, recreational department? Because as you and I both know, uh, the recreational department, when you can create a uh, successful rec um stream and, and departments inside your studio you can have a you can have a pretty profitable dance studio what do you think are some of the things that you've done with your recreational um department that has made it really stand out and has attracted the right people to you well i mean the one thing that i did last year that i just it's like why did it take me 35 years to figure this out mm-hmm. is i truly turned my dance recital the end of the year recital into a um into really a, a moment that features the recreational student and not the dance team kids. You know, I've always had the dance team kids be a part of the recital, but you know, all the uh, discussion about, okay, this particular team won this and this particular team got that. And in the introductions before the numbers, you know, uh, I would do uh, special blurbs for those dance team kids. And the more I thought about that, I was like, wait a minute, those kids, you know, get to travel all the time. And then they have their own showcase in January at the top of the year before we start traveling. So, you know, this is the time to toot the, the, the rest of the dance studio of Fresno's community's horn, you know? And so I really changed um, my recital up by featuring the rec kids in the opening montages and our videos. Um, I made it a huge, um, we followed a theme last season and we're doing it again this year that made it feel like it was a movie premiere. So my, my lobby was like going to, a you know, a Hollywood movie premiere. It was all just crazy and there was fabulous and we there was a walk of fame and there was every kid that walked in the door got a star on the walk of fame and then they got a shirt with their name on the back I mean I made a big big deal about Mm. you know my recreational kids and it was a hit it was a huge hit and um I had received so much positive feedback from that received you know new students I'm sure um, my recital. So, you know, that, that right there, uh, was a big one, you know, and, and, and in terms of other things, you know, we've always, there's just little things that we do during the course of the season that I hope will make the recreational people feel like they're, you know, part of a, of a, a really great family. And so we'll do, Oh, we'll do like taco truck night for the entire studio where everybody is involved or with my booster club and our fundraising. You don't have to be on the team. You don't have to be on a dance team to fundraise. You can be a part of the booster club, whether or not you're on the team. I think that makes a difference. We'll do Halloween parties, you know, for all the kids, um, bring a friend. We, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that we do to hopefully continue to incorporate um, the recreational students in the studio. You know, one thing I did say at at the, our event in Vegas, your event in Vegas was that, you know, I make sure that my recreational kids get the best times for classes. Mm. Um, Those working parents, they want those five thirty times. And so I know a lot of schools will not do that. They will, you know, they will put the recreational classes at off hours and I'm the exact opposite. I put them at the 530, 630s. When they when those parents want to bring their kids, I, I make sure there's there's times available for them so that I can get them in the door. Um, rather than the late 8.30 at night or 3 in the, three o'clock in the afternoon when no one can get there. So those things, I think, all add up too. 
Yeah, c- c- completely. Uh, and I loved, you know, that was one of the big takeaways for, for a lot of our inner circle members was, you know, your competitive kids are going to come whenever you schedule, you know, whenever you schedule the classes. So don't, you know, don't necessarily think you have to put them in the peak times. Correct. Because those kids, again, they're, they're going to, they're so, those kids are going to do whatever they want to be on the team. They want to stay on the team. You know, they're going to work their schedules around to get to you. So, um, and, and it just takes just the courage to do it once, because if there's somebody that says, and this did happen to me, well, we just simply can't make that. That's not going to work for us. And, you know, I always, I'm so sorry, but this is what I need to do. Uh, would love to still have her. If something changes, please come back, you know, uh, mm-hmm. please come back or if you can work your schedule around, I'll hold a spot open for, you know, so those are the kind of things that, you know, it's kind of hard at first, but once you do it, then everybody goes, Oh, Oh, she's serious. Okay. Well, I guess we're going to be going at seven thirty at night. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. They, they like to, they like to kind of test it to see if you'll change it for them. Yeah. It, and you can't blame them. You know, I don't blame them. People are, especially kids now. Oh my gosh, Clint, they're so busy. And with all the AP classes and all the stuff that these kids have to do now, especially mm. once they hit high school, I, I don't know how they do it. It's, it's really remarkable to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. I want to talk to you about your office team. Uh, you know, one of the questions we get a lot from studio owners is like when, you know, it's all me at the moment, you know, young studio owners who are just getting started, you know, when do I bring someone on board or for studio owners that have been going for a little while, like how much do I hand over? Do I need an office manager, a receptionist? How do I, you know, who should I have on board the team? How should I work with them? So I'd love to get a little bit of insight around how you structure your, um, you know, admin department in your studio. Yes. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're a owner who likes to teach and that's me, I'm describing me. I love my I love my teaching time. Um, I, it's crucial that your office, you have an, uh, an office manager and you have people out there out front who are, are representing you. So um, that's a huge, I think a huge, huge part of, of my success is my front office. I'm very lucky. I've had a wonderful gal who's been with me, Martha Allen. She's been with me now for, I want to say over 15 years. And, and, you know, she started as my, in my ladies tap class with me. And so, you know, it was just a series of events that brought her to me. And we're so lucky we have her because she is on it. Um, She knows my philosophy again. And so, and she just, she has a warm and welcoming way with people and she's got great communication skills. So I, I, she handles the daily ins and outs of my office, but, you know, we have me- weekly meetings. I meet with her every Monday mm-hmm. um, when the studio is closed and we go through together what's coming up, what I need done. We prioritize. I mean, and then she makes it happen, you know, and then I have four gals out, out in my office that are, you know, part-time that, that work under her. And they're all again, personable, um, exciting, really ladies that, um, that are, that, you know, I feel like they care about me and they present, um, information the way I would present information to parents. So that, that's a big deal. Um, you know, they never seem like they are going out of their way to help people. They're, they're going out of their way to help people because they enjoy what they're doing. So that's, that's a huge thing. You know, and as far as like the, the numbers go, you know, I'm the, the product of CPAs. My mom and my dad and my brothers yeah. are all CPAs. I know. <laughs> so lucky, right? And so I, I, you know, I'm lucky that when I have a, an issue with something that pertains to a big financial thing, you know, I can go to my mother and my brother, whoever, you know, wants to take my phone call. <laughs> yeah. Whoever picks up basically. Yeah, pr- pretty much. But, um, you know, so, you know, I would suggest to any studio, you know, owner that they have a good CPA in their back pocket mm. who, um, you know, it, it kind of keeps up with, you know, the, the whole, 1099 thing and the workman's comp, all that kind of stuff. You got to have somebody who, who, you know, stays current mm-hmm. on those things and they keep, can keep you current 
you know, Mm. because that's where I see things happening sometimes with some studio owners. They get so overwhelmed because they didn't know they were supposed to send this out. This was considered an outside service and that they have to send them a 1099 and, and so on and so forth, you know. So it's really important to have somebody on your team that you can go to for things, uh, questions like that. Yeah, great, great advice and 100% uh, agree with you on that one. You need someone that knows, uh, you know, the money side of things, um, you know, and yeah, like you said, California, like... California law changes like all the time. It's like mm-hmm. just when you think you've got a grasp on something, then they change it to, <laughs> they change it or uh, the percentage on the, on the uh, you know, on the federal income tax, whatever. It's constantly evolving. It's like a moving target. Yeah. So. You know, I can't stress enough the, that how important that side of your business is. Mm. So what do you think are the qualities that, that you have that have contributed to you building, you know, what, what is a successful dance studio? <laughs> it's hard to talk about yourself, I know. It's so, that's so tricky. Um, well, I, I'd like to think that I'm, a, um, I'm pretty good at team building because in order for uh, my school to run at the level it runs at, um, everybody who works for me is, um, I feel like they care not only about my students and the studio, but they care about me. And I, in return, I try to treat them like, really like... Um, cherished family members, you know, um, I, I, t- I make a point to make sure I tell them often what a great job they're doing. I don't just call them in or call them when something's going south or something's going wrong. I, I think b- a team building is such a huge, um, element to what I do. And, um, I've just been, I, I guess lucky. I don't know, but you know, the fact that I don't have a huge turnover, um, in my faculty, I mean, my ballet teacher that I took from when I was a little girl works for me. She has been with me over 20 years now and she's turning, um, 80 this year. And she's wow. she, look about a beautiful woman. She still, I mean, she comes in three days a week and she gets it done. And I just, I'm so delighted every time I get to talk to her for a minute or two. So I think for me, I, I think I'm fairly good at team building. I think that, um, you know, I have this, this, I have to stay progressive. I have this thing that drives me, Clint. I um, I don't want to wake up one morning and and find that my studio has become insignificant or that I've turned into you know a, a Dolly Dinkle dance studio. I want to <laughs> for, for as long as I you know I own it and run it. I want to um, I want to matter, I guess, and so. You know, for me, staying progressive or staying out ahead um, is crucial. And I think nurturing my creative side has helped me uh, do that. I always want to be better, whether it's like right now I'm in this kick. I want to improve my office um, technology and I want to get the technology in my studio, you know, up to speed. I want to get iPads in there in the rooms and I want to get video and I, at the touch of a button, I want to be able to have a screen come down and we can show video or we can, you know, we can stream something cool that's being seen. So for me, it's always about trying to get better. Um, You know, whether it's, you know, bringing in a a modern teacher because I've got a big influx of seniors next year that want to dance and, you know, in college. So, okay, we got to bring in modern teachers to get these kids up to speed or whatever. I'm always trying to stay one step ahead, I guess, um, so that I can be in the right moment at the right time. (laughs) <laughs> and then I think lastly is communication. I think um, I'm a pretty decent communicator. So, um, and that's not just with my faculty, but it's with the parents and my mm. students. I think that's a big thing that is really important. I know sometimes uh, it's kind of hard to go out and um, wander through my hallways and talk to parents because I've got three projects or three items that have to be done before I go home at night and I'm pressed for time. But I find that um, if I don't go out and, you know, communicate on occasion with all those folks sitting in my lobby or the kids, um, I will begin to lose touch 
with what's going on under my own roof. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's happened to me uh, in the past via experience. You know, I, I, I learned the hard way. So I think communication too is, is huge. Yeah. Huge items. Completely. Look, I, I always love, and, and the reason I wanted to get you on the podcast was because we've had lots of conversations now and I had the pleasure of bringing you as one of our guest speakers to the Inner Circle and you are, you are so passionate about our, our industry and your drive, determination and just passion for, like you said, like always, you know, innovating and improving, you know, that continuous improvement ethic that you have. Um, I, I just adore. So thank you so much, Sue, for, for sharing um, so much with our studio owners today. Oh, thank you, Clint. You, you're, I really enjoy always chatting with you. And I think what you're doing is amazing. And I wish, you know, gosh, I wish there would have been something like this back, uh, back in the day when I was a young studio owner. So I, I would encourage your listeners to just, you know, uh, keep on dialing into whatever Clint Salter's doing. Thank you. Very, very <laughs> kind of you. Um, and Sue, where can, our, where can our studio owners go to find out more about you and your studio? Yes. Um, oh, you can go to my website. That's uh, www.fresnodanceonline. One big word, fresnodanceonline.com. Awesome. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Sue. Thanks, Clint. Thank you for joining us today. For all the resource links from the show and to receive access to our free dance studio growth training, make sure you visit transformmydancestudio.com.